now. Okay. Oh, you got it? All right, thank you. So thanks for coming. My name is Kathy Bakery Clips. I'm a landscape architect uh, and project manager in the Boston Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, I wanna make sure you all know that this meeting is being recorded. We're gonna be posting uh, uh, the recording on the project website later in the week. Um, so you'll be able to share it with any friends who are unable to make it to this meeting tonight. I have to say, I'm so impressed with the enthusiasm and feedback uh, that we've received from the community and your patience while we found a suitable date for this meeting. We have joked that the one thing we were able to take off was uh, take off our list was trying to find a snow date for this. Uh, so the snow is not an issue for our ability to move forward with this meeting. So that's at least a positive. It's clear that this is a neighborhood that loves the park and sees the opportunity for the improvements in the neighborhood. Often we think about park improvements as a build it and they will come uh, situation, but it's clear that you're already here and you love this place. This meeting is gonna be a little bit different from a typical community meeting that we had uh, in person. It will be an online presentation and a discussion hosted by the parks department and the park design team from Kyle Zick Landscape Architecture. We wanna thank you for trying this new format and uh, um, we certainly miss seeing everyone's faces. This Zoom uh, style webinar, can we move to the next slide? This, oh, one back, yep. Uh, this Zoom style webinar has a couple of ways to interact. You can raise your hand, there should be a, uh, down at the bottom of your menu, there's a raise hand icon. Um, so you can raise your hand during the Q&A and we'll call on you roughly in order. Um, if you're joining by phone, which doesn't look like we have anybody joining by phone right now, but if people join us uh, via phone, I'm gonna try to prioritize them uh, over in-person people. You can also uh, type your questions and answers in the Q&A box and I'll go through those and I'll read those aloud and then we can respond to those as we come to them. Um, you can also exit the meeting if you need to by clicking the leave button in the lower right hand corner. Um, we uh, unfortunately don't have any in interpretation tonight, but uh, maybe in future presentations. Okay, one more. See the agenda? Yeah. So today we're gonna to reacquaint you with the project team, give a brief recap of the funding goals and, and the last meeting. We'll talk about the great data we gathered from the survey and then dig into the site design of Ringer Park. We'll open up for a discussion about all of that information and there's quite a bit. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with next steps. I wanna introduce the project team to you. Uh, my contact info is as kathybaker eclipse at boston.gov or 617-961-3058. I also wanna introduce Christine Brandeo, who's the outreach coordinator. Um, she coordinates ongoing volunteer efforts in the parks, coordinates park programs, and is a point of contact for people long after the park improvements are over. Uh, so she's a great resource for some of those longer term um, issues in park. I also want to introduce Kyle Zick and Danielle Desolitz from Kyle Zick Landscape Architecture. They're the design team that are going to be uh, walking through the design possibilities for this site. Um, let me check to see whether there are any. Um, I also want to just point out Connor Newman uh, from the Office of Neighborhood Services. He doesn't look like he's in the audience today, but um, he's a great resource for some of the broader neighborhood issues. And um, does not look like there are any um, elected officials, but if, if you are there and you'd like to, um, to say a word, please raise your hand, use the raise icon icon. Use the raise hand icon and I can unmute you. Um, so let's move to the next slide. Can we go to the next? The park design, the circles? Yep, doesn't look like it. Yep, yep, that one. 
So when we consider the park improvements, we're incorporating a lot of different factors such as City of Boston priorities, safety and regulatory guidelines, parks and recreation goals, and also community input. Kathy, it looks like um, Councilor Braden will be joining a little later also. Thank you, thank you, Seattle. So when, when she's able to join, um, we can, we can uh, allow her some time to, to say a few words. The City of Boston priorities, um, we're incorporating a lot of different factors, um, expanding walkable access to parks and throughout the city, Boston was the first city on the East Coast to have a park within a 10 minute uh, walk of every resident. We wanna address equity in our city, especially in our open space. We're working to create a climate resilient city that can withstand our changing environment, promoting the health of all our residents and creating a healthy city and prioritizing housing and community building in the city. And specifically in the parks, we wanna provide parks that are accessible and available to all, build parks that offer a diverse and balanced and efficient mix of uses have a meaningful and inclusive community engagement process, create adaptive and resilient landscapes and promote connections with our parks. We go to the next, okay. Uh, so tonight's the second meeting for the design work for the comprehensive plan. We anticipate engaging with the community throughout the winter while we finalize the comprehensive plan in the spring. The funding for the design work is coming from the City of Boston Capital Funding and some recent developments in the neighborhood. We do not have funding for the future construction yet, but are using this phase of work to identify the, the work that needs to be done, prioritize those items and estimate how much of the those improvements will cost. When we're ready to implement those projects, we will again be re-engaging with the community and discussing those specific plans with, uh, with the community. Uh, Ringer Park has remained a constant presence in Alston while a lot of changes have occurred around it. Boston Parks wants Ringer Park to keep up with the neighborhood. The work we're here to discuss today is to develop a long-term plan for the park and prioritize the short-term improvements to get us to this vision. Past improvement projects have studied individual park elements, but have lacked the connections between those park elements to create the whole. This has resulted in some areas like the playground and athletic facilities being regularly updated while others lacking investments over a longer period of time. We're gonna talk about a lot of exciting ideas tonight, but there's not a timeline for implementation yet. I'm gonna turn over the slides to Kyle and Danielle to talk about the details of the park, starting with what we heard from at the last meeting. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Hopefully many of you were able to join us at the first community meeting that we had. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna run through what we heard, a little bit of what we heard at that meeting and also to summarize the, um, the results from the online survey that we had. So when we talked last, um, we heard, these are very quick summaries, but which I think very often we find is reflected in the same information, the same, um, initiatives and um, vision from the community in the survey. So we'll go through all of that. Um, we did hear pretty strongly that there was a significant support for a fenced in dog park, um, separate, um, potentially separate from the ball field that's there now that's the way it's being used. Um, we heard a lot about trash and site and the maintenance and the levels of what's there. Um, we heard about uh, lighting in the park. Um, we also, heard about um, the potential um, idea of converting the Little League ball field into a multi-use field um, that can be used by a wider range of people. Um, certainly an update for the playground area that's just beyond this image that we can see here. Um, safety um, and imp other improvements to the urban wild area, the, the wooded area in the park. Um, and then there was some discussion about the sports court lighting that's on site now, um, how that is using, whether or not it could be um, re-implemented. Um, and then the drainage issues throughout the site. So those are things that we heard at the community meeting. And I'm gonna dig into each, uh, most of those elements a little bit more based on the results that we heard from the survey. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So after the last meeting, which um, was mid-October, we had a survey run for a little over three weeks um, and we had a total of 19 questions and we had 156 responses. So that's great. That gives us a lot of really good feedback um, that helps us um, with the design process. And as I said, more often than not, as this did, what we heard from the survey kind of backs up a lot of what we heard from the original community meeting that we just addressed. Um, so I'm just, I'm not gonna go through all 19 of those questions because some um, are a little iterative, but we do that on purpose. Um, but I'm gonna go through a couple of these. So one of the, the, what we talked about here, the first few questions are just kind of get a sense of um, where and how you use the park and when you use the park. Um, so one of the questions was, um, when, what time of year do you use the park most? As you can see here, 79% of our respondents said they use it all four seasons. No one said they come strictly in the winter. Probably not a surprise. Um, and there's fairly um, significant dispersal throughout the rest of the year. Um, we asked if you have a favorite time of day to visit. Um, and early kind of kind of spread throughout the day, but as you can see, kind of mid-afternoon, 3 p.m., uh, 5, 5 p.m. or later were pretty popular as it is um, before 9 a.m. Um, with work hours and school hours, that makes a lot of sense. We did also ask a couple other things. Um, we One of the key questions that we asked too was um, which entrances you visited the park from, which we use most often. And again, not a surprise, 50% 50, 50 of people said that they either use the Alston Street entrance or the Gordon Street entrance. So those are the two main entrances, so that makes some sense. Um, and we asked about issues with those uh, those entrances, and we heard pretty reliably that the trash, um, litter at the site, accessibility um, for everybody, and lighting were some 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 of the issues at that at those entrances. Um, this site, so this where we have direct data, um, where we asked a very specific question, like the last one, we'll represent it in graphs. Um, we had a lot of open-ended questions because um, that really allows you to provide any kind of information or the strength of what you feel most strongly needs to happen or, or not happen at the park. So these are gonna be represented like this, which is a word cloud. So the bigger the image or the bigger the word size, um, the more we heard it in your feedback. Um, so one of the questions that we asked, we asked this kind of in a couple of different ways, a couple of different questions. So we asked, what changes would you like to see at Ringer Park? We also asked as the next question, what was the most important change? Uh, very reliably, the top three answers for both of these questions um, as write-ins were more trash cans or um, a better maintenance, um, more trash cans or uh, trash cans emptied more often. Um, number two to both questions was a dedicated area for dogs. And number three was lighting in the park. We did hear other, um, other responses such as talking about drainage and walkways, trail improvements and court lighting here, but you can kind of see these are some of the words that um, came up most often in your responses. Can we go to the next slide, please Scott, thanks. So we also asked what should not change about the park. So um, again, as you can see, the biggest letter, biggest words here are trees, courts, uh, trees and courts. So we heard um, that the urban wild was extremely, was very popular and very well loved. Um, we heard, you know, the, the overall tree canopy in the park um, was really significant and a key element to the park in and of itself and its character. Um, there was also comments about the green space and, and the amount of open space on site, um, but also the basketball courts and the tennis courts. So those were key items that, we, that you did all did not want to change. The, the kind of next level was um, there was a lot of comments about the diversity of the spaces, um, the variety of both active and passive spaces um, and uses in the park. Um, one of the other questions we asked that's not represented here was, um, are there, sorry, um, <clears throat> the ways, ways in which you think that this park could better benefit the community? And the resounding answer on this one was more community-based activities, um, whether it's movies, markets, festivals, shows, any of those items that were mentioned, um, pet training classes, um, but just the fact that more programming is a, is a pretty strong desire for the community. Now that is important to us, not we're going to, as designers, as the landscape architects and the design team, we're not gonna program those activities, but it helps us 
determine what kind of spaces um, to create and to provide in the park in its next phase of design. Um, <clears throat> so um, the next slide should be, um, oh, we asked about how, um, for which activities, this should come up in a second, there we go. Um, which activities do you and your and or your family typically come to Ringer Park? So this is one of those you could respond, select all that applied. Um, walking, running was absolutely the number one. Over six, almost 65% of the community said they come here to walk or run. Just relaxing and hanging out, sunset viewing, reading, that was all about also about 60%. A lot of people did say they just passed through. This is a connector or on their commute um, to some of the transit. Over 57% of the community responded that way. Um, a lot of people said they use it for the trail. So again, kind of supports the walking and running um, and also dog walking. So those kind of all go hand in hand. Um, and then they also, we also responded over 30% said you come just to play in open space, just to have some green area, some lawn area that you can just run around in um, or play ball, things of that kind of thing. What I did think was particularly interesting is how far down this chart playground comes up. Um, so only 18 out of 135 responses that we got said they come to this playground, uh, this park particularly for the playground. So that's pretty telling for us as well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, so the next slide um, and the last couple ones. So again, we did ask uh, activities, programs, amenities, what kinds of things would you like to see more of? Um, and again, if it's programs, that's not something that directly, directly impacts the design, but uh, amenities, it might. Um, so again, the overwhelming response, um, top few answers, the number one response actually we got was adult fitness um, equipment, which when we've been in the park, um, we've seen adults using the playground equipment when, when children aren't there. So that's something that if we can provide both of those um, elements in the park, we'll, we will look at doing. But again, that's, so that was the number one response, but that only received 10 out of 100 responses. So it was 10% responded that way. The next um, couple of responses were more tables and chairs picnic spaces, benches, also dedicated off-leash dog area was pretty high up, drinking fountain or bottle filling station, um, community garden was on the list, and there's any number of other things, barbecues, um, you know, potential for soccer, maintaining the tennis, um, a number of different elements that could be included. And then the last two I think we're gonna look at closely here were the questions specific to, oh, no, I'm sorry, a couple more. Two for uh, playground and then a couple on the urban wilds. So we did ask what must haves um, do you have for the playground? And these are usually pretty reliable responses, but we always wanna ask because if, if we're not thinking the right way or we um, wanna make sure we're designing it for your community. Um, so swings, no surprise, always comes um, pretty high on the list. So spring, swings was the number one answer, climbing structures, um, and then slides on down. What was pretty high in the list also was tables and chairs. So if you're up there and you wanna stop and have a snack or somewhere else to sit and relax while kids are playing, um, we'll look at accommodating those type of facilities in the playground also. We did also ask a question about the playground um, that was what style of playground um, you might wanna see and 50, um, about 55% of respondents said they would prefer a nature style playground. Um, so that's also something we'll take into account. Um, so the final two questions that we did ask that we'll talk about tonight were um, the urban wild area, the wooded area up towards um, the West End House um, and that portion on the higher topography area. Um, so um, we asked how much, uh, how often, you all use this, this area. 60% um, of the respondents said that they use it very frequently. Um, a few, was about 30% said yes, but pretty rarely. And only right around 11% said no, they never use it. Um, so that's helpful. And then also then as a follow-up to that, we asked if you, 
if you use it, what do you like best about the urban wilds? And if you don't use it, please also tell us why. Um, so um, kind of the, the key responses here for a what. Um, was loved again, the, the big letters, the big words. Um, it, the number one response was that it provides an escape from the city. It's a peaceful area, uh, has loads of big trees, you have shade, um, and it's a big, beautiful natural landscape. Um, so we hear that loud and clear, which tells us don't mess with it too, too much. Um, but then what you didn't like about it was the trash. Um, there's a lot of litter we hear, there's a lot of uh, broken glass up there. Um, and then there was a fair not, number of responses that they don't use it simply because it doesn't feel safe, in particular as, uh, as a woman or someone um, using that area with children didn't really feel safe taking children into that uh, the, the urban garden. Uh, sorry, urban wilds area. So that's all information that in addition to what we hear from you all tonight, we'll take towards um, into the design and some of what um, Kyle is gonna present and some of the early thoughts that we have tonight to share with you. Thanks, Danielle, and thanks to the community, because we really appreciate your coming to the first public meeting. Some of you came to the drop-in session on site after the first meeting and contributing so much feedback to these surveys, because it really helps us develop park designs that are responsive to what you want. Um, and the more you tell us, the more we can really craft this master plan, this comprehensive plan to be very much um, a recipe of what this community would like. So I'm going to review some design ideas that illustrate your comments. You know, here's some of your comments and here's a design idea, that kind of thing. And then also your feedback helped us start to form some guiding principles for the plan, which include accessibility improvements, addressing safety concerns, improving or making maintenance easier, and then placemaking. And we'll have the rest of the presentation organized loosely around that. So you all know the park fairly well. Um, so, we, but we look at, for these slideshows particularly, we look at the park for, as an aerial view. So I just wanted to get you oriented and then we'll just go over some of the terminology we use when talking about it. Um, so here is Ringer Park, the West End House, Alston Street on this side, Gordon on the other, Jackson Mann School is right here at the tip. And that's the Little League ball field playground, the courts, and the urban wild, just for orientation. And all the purple arrows are the five entrances. So we're going to start off by talking about pathways. And this relates to accessibility. This is a map or a plan showing the existing paths and their materials. So the purple are concrete paths, yellow or gravel, um, the dashed blue are just packed earth, the dark blue are asphalt, and then in the urban wild we have packed earth as well. And this is important to point out because there are some things we need to improve just from a code standpoint for to um, update for accessibility. Also, you told us about drainage concerns um, and then all, and how we can access certain elements. So one thing we start to look at is how do we improve the paths based on what we've heard? And I'll go through these one by one. So along this main spine from Gordon to Alston Street, there's several things that we're recommending or in that we heard from you. The first from a code standpoint is the concrete path that goes through the park at Gordon Street is not accessible because it's too steep. You, know, you all remember it, it goes up a little hill right there. But there is a, a worn path at the lower elevation that actually would be accessible. So we would formalize that path, remove the one that goes on the steeper path, and then this main spine would all be accessible. Item number two is widening the path in the section along the courts. And that's important just from a general usability standpoint, but also so we can get maintenance vehicles from one side of the park to the other, because the park's maintenance vehicles cannot get past the courts right now. And that's a problem from a trash pickup or mowing the lawn or just general you know, maintenance. Also from a code standpoint, there's a walkway that leads up to the playground that is too steep according to accessibility guidelines. So that's something we would recommend regrading. The gravel path along the outfield of the Little League field could be paved so that it was accessible. 
And then we also heard about drainage and icing concerns along this section at the bottom of the hill. So we can add a swale or other drainage features to help intercept some of that. And then the primary path in the urban wild that goes basically from Gordon Street to Alston Street is something that could be formalized in the wood chip or the earth path, um, either made with crushed stone or a pavement. And at the entrances where we have cobblestones, they would be removed because they're not accessible either. So some just very basic but needed improvements to the walkway system. And some of those improvements have a direct impact on how parks can maintain the site. The black dashed line from Webley Street comes in, they turn around at that circle, the performance space, and they can go toward Alston Street and then up the hill, but they really can't get to other parts of the park. So some of these improvements I'm talking about allow them to get to other parts of the park, pick up trash, mow, do tree work, which is important for the overall care of the park. In terms of vegetation management, we heard a lot of things um, about different elements of the park. One, like the urban wild, preserve it, enhance it. Um, we love the wooded area. So, I mean, and what we're saying is each one of these boundaries we're showing is a different type of vegetation and it requires different management. So the urban wild is different than say number one, which is turf for a sports field. And, um, and also different than tree-lined walkways or wooded buffers, because we wanna make sure there's vegetation between neighbors and different uses. Um, but also there's opportunities to change some of the vegetation and how it's managed today. Like number four here, the orange area, we heard from a number of you, wouldn't it be great if we had vegetation to support pollinators? And that would be on that steep slope along that main walkway. Another thing to think about is where it's steeper and further up the hill, could that be a taller grass meadow and not mowed as regularly? And again, it's an opportunity to have a little bit more biodiversity in the plant materials on the park. So the urban wilds more specifically, we want to talk about some of the concerns, but also some of the um, recommendations we can make. There's a lot of erosion um, in the urban wild, and some of that is because paths have been created and worn that are going straight up and down the hill, which is the place where water wants to follow. And because it's going the fastest down the most direct point, it wants to erode the soil. So that's something we can address. We also heard a number of things about concerns about safety and security. Something we could consider is adding security cameras. And that is more than just in this meeting deciding that other stakeholders have to um, weigh in on that, but that's something we can look at. I've already talked about maintenance access and improving that because with that, we can improve litter pickup and also just kind of surveillance and observing activities through that area. And then there's some very specific things we can do in terms of woodland management. It's hazard tree removal, pruning, invasive vegetation management, and protecting vegetation. So this plan shows some of the recommendations that could be implemented to improve some of the conditions I just mentioned. Um, first, I had mentioned the realigning the, the main spine to make it accessible. By doing that and removing this path, we need to extend the urban wild pass to that new path, pretty simple. There are some sections that we've highlighted here with these green lines where the trails are really too steep and they're really susceptible to erosion. And they're basically duplicate, particularly if you're here at Alston Street, you have two paths that are right next to each other. One of them is not very stable. So we could close that, not change access, but improve the resource. And then this yellow line suggests that that main path could be something more defined, either crushed stone or a pavement um, to make that accessible, but also um, something that could be main maintained more easily. Something we would also do if that was crushed stone versus pavement, we would wanna manage the stormwater uphill of that so we wouldn't erode that path. Some of the steeper sections of trail to remain, we could add what we call water bars so basically there are little steps um, across the path that direct water off the path and into the vegetated area to minimize erosion. 
Then lighting. Uh, um, the survey certainly indicated this, and we heard it loud and clear at, at our meetings, that there's a concern about nighttime safety. And I've been out here at night, and there's big contrast between areas that are lit well and areas that are really dark. Um, so this plan is the same orientation that I've shown you already of the park. Each one of these yellow symbols represents an existing light. Um, you can see the main spine from Alston to Gordon Street here. There's a couple lights in the woods and there's lights on the West End house and there are some other um, at entrances. Also to note, there's an emergency telephone uh, along the main spine and there are some security cameras on the West End house. The existing lights are generally these concrete poles that are fairly tall. Here's the emergency telephone I mentioned. There are some additional lights that are being added in um, 2021, the proposed light pylons and entry signs. So that will introduce a number of solar lights into the park. And there, so this is a proposed or a suggested recommendation. A lot of those additional lights are shown with these smaller circles. But then we're, we look for the other dark locations and where we can add other light fixtures. And potentially we could add lights along that urban wild path that goes from Alston closer to Gordon Street. The other thing you'll notice is the rectangle on the sports courts. That's something we'll talk about tonight in terms of is there um, a plan for having those lights on in the evening on a timer and being able to have shielding to, to minimize light pollution and have extend the use of those courts into the evening. Placemaking. So um, Kathy mentioned this at the beginning of the meeting that there's been updates of the ball field or the playground, but other parts of the park haven't been updated. I mean, the great thing is that here's the circular space that is used um, and it's permitted under as a performance space at some times, but it has these really great Zelkova trees around it. So it's a space that has a good feeling. It just isn't really used um, to its highest potential. But there are some interesting things about this space beyond just the trees. You have some grade change with, um, leading up to the playground, which actually gives it a nice perspective when you're up at that level looking down here. So you could naturally think of this as a performance space. But there's also a lot of concerns. There's erosion. There's desire lines where, where people um, deviate from the existing path system. But that tells us something that the path doesn't go where people want to go. So in terms of placemaking, we start to look at these spaces and see how can we make them better and accommodate some of the events that you mentioned in uh, the meetings and the online survey. So here's back to a plan view again. The courts are here. This is um, one of the entries and this is the playground. This is a suggestion that this site could be formalized maybe with a different geometry. And because of the grade change, think of using that um, elevation change, there could be a formalized stage um, and then a couple rows of amphitheater type seats so that you could actually have a small concert there or there could be an, um, um, a fair or an art show or something like that. And then some of these other walls or, or benches along the edges help to define where people should walk or not walk. I'll show you this also in 3D just to give you a sense. This is kind of looking a uh, little bit more of a bird's eye perspective toward the playground. Here's the courts over to the side. The idea that there's a stage that's bounded by some seat walls or benches and then a changed circulation pattern. A few other views high above the playground looking back to the space or at eye level from the park entry looking toward the playground, the basketball courts to your right or just shift it over a little bit to the left with a similar perspective. It's not the only way to do this. You know, what if you worked with the circular form that's already there and maybe took a more informal or rustic approach to how some of the site furnishings are developed. So we work with the existing circle, maybe we add a new walkway which follows a desire line there. Um, but there's seat walls that are more bouldery, inspired by kind of the pudding stone outcrops, but still have that same amphitheater type seating, just fairly minimal, a couple rows at the bottom of the stairs there, and then an informal stage. So what does that look like from similar perspectives as the other? 
um, you know, it's just different in form, but some of the uh, ideas and the program elements are similar. So what we have to decide is, is this the right space to do something like this? What's the right feeling or style um, or geometry? And here are some ins inspiration images just to further um, elaborate on this. So when I talk about amphitheater style seating, you know, these are bigger blocks than stairs. You know, they're basically equivalent to three stairs. You know, it's seat height, 18 inches tall. And it's just naturally built into the hill. And then one space, you know, could be more circular in form. There's an opportunity maybe that stormwater could be managed, maybe not at this scale, but there's a, a way to integrate vegetation and some of the other geometry together. So to further talk about placemaking, we have some opportunities at each of the five entrances, and I'll go through these one by one. The existing entrances are not that great, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, some of them really feel like they're at the end of a dead end street, and you happen to be able to enter the park. And that's the case with Webley or Emory. Um, Gordon and Alston entrances have that vocabulary of a mortared stone wall and piers with bollards. Um, so it'd be nice to have some consistency from entrance to entrance, but we also want to think about where does the vehicle need to enter the park, either from emergency standpoint or a maintenance standpoint, or where should it just be pedestrian access? So at each one of these, this one's at Webley, we're doing an overlay on top of a, a photo to suggest that vocabulary of stone wall and pillar should get added to places that don't have it. And that this would continue to be a vehicular entrance for maintenance or emergency access. That Ringer Park light pylon is added, suggesting that that's coming in the future. And that this orange line is saying that maybe there's a different path alignment that follows more where people want to go versus hugging the fence line. And there would be some kind of identification signage saying Ringer Park. At Emory, similarly, at, suggesting adding a wall in piers um, as a foreground to that performance space that I mentioned. And then we also do some editing. You know, with, once you have that wall, you don't need the bollards. The Ringer Playground sign can be incorporated into the wall and some of the other parks rule signs could be cleaned up as well so that everything is, there's no duplication or anything that's out of date. And the other thing to note is this entrance would be purely pedestrian. We don't feel like we need to have a vehicle enter at this location. Um, so at Gordon Street, we actually have the entrance proposed to um, move to the left. And I'm sorry, I actually have a home phone that's, uh, that's uh, ringing right now. It should be <laughs> yeah, My probably. Phone earlier. Okay, it's not a snow day tomorrow. Um, so the entrance is shifting from its current location here over. Now, why are we doing that? Pardon me one second. My phone rang earlier, so I think I, I empathize, Kyle. Thank you. I unplugged the phone. Um, so the orange line is the new alignment the path that would be accessible, avoiding that hill. Um, it would be scaled for vehicular access with a gate so that maintenance can access here, empty the trash, mow the lawn, do tree work. And a new crosswalk could be added. There's no crosswalk here now. And we can work with um, BTD and Public Works to make sure this has traffic calming and can slow speeds down. Then the urban wild entrance on Alston Street would be widened so that um, and have a vehicular gate, particularly for maintenance access. Um, pedestrians still flow past this gate. They don't have to hop it or go under it. Um, but this allows us to do the important work of tree work, removing trash and that kind of thing. Now, Alston Street near Greylock this entrance, we shift a little bit away because we want to have more space as a buffer between the park entrance and the house. And these uh, green lollipops are sitting with vegetation. It's trees or shrubs or something just to provide that buffer. And by doing that, we have to shift some lights and the light pylon comes and we have to shift the path alignment some. 
but it seems like um, an important thing to do for the abutter and for the park. So then in terms of the playground, some of the feedback you heard Danielle talk about was that people, it's, they don't come to this park particularly for the playground. We know it's well used. We know there's a school that abuts the park. Um, so it's a, it's a function we want here, but it needs an update. So this is just a, a plan view of the existing playground. Um, the performance space I mentioned is here. This is the two to five play equipment, the five to 12 equipment, and there's swings and a splash pad. What we've heard generally is that all of that works. It just needs to be updated. So what if it was fairly similar in its arrangement? So two to five play equipment here, but they have their own swings. Splash pad remains because the infrastructure is there. Two to five play equipment, no, sorry, five to 12 equipment and five to 12 swings. And there would be some seating so that caregivers or others can still hang out here and it's more intergenerational. And we're suggesting there could be some fitness equipment elements, part of a larger fitness circuit in the park. Other things we wanna do are um, addressing the accessibility I mentioned, lead, the leading here on the path, but also with some of the play elements, trying to maintain this footprint. We don't feel like we need to expand further. Um, and also have inclusive play because there is an autism strand in some of the adjacent schools. Um, so that would be helpful that this equipment is suitable for all abilities and interests. So then I mentioned the fitness circuit. This dashed orange line is suggesting that within Ringer Park, there could be a fitness circuit that has different elements. And, you know, these are up for uh, discussion, but, you know, there's a walking loop um, and then potentially there's like a pull-up station and then there's a sit-up station. You use the courts for certain exercises. And then you've got the woodlands where you can go up and down a hill, that kind of thing. So you start to have more functions spread out through the variety of this interesting park. And these aren't exercise elements that have move, moving parts. The people are the moving parts. So there's a sit-up station or pull-up station um, balance, stepping up and down, those kind of things. Low tech, very simple, but add actually a lot of variety and interest in terms of um, fitness opportunity. Then we wanna talk about enhancing park programming. So the courts are, um, are something that we've had a lot of feedback on. One thing I wanna put in perspective is where's Ringer in respect to other open spaces in the area? This dashed blue line is the one mile radius. So there's a number of parks in the area, but what do they provide? Um, and this is particularly related to courts and if they're lit or not. So Ringer, we have the two tennis courts and basketball courts. They have lighting, but the lighting's turned off. Um, and then I have a list over here to the left. You'll see that most of the courts are lit, some are not. Um, and some of that may depend on the last time those courts were renovated. But I just want to put that in perspective. And then talk about the courts themselves. There's a lot of opportunities here. Um, one, the tennis courts, typically when they're renovated, uh, if the community is interested, we add pickleball striping so that there's more potential use there. I know at the drop-in session and in the um, first meeting, we heard, we heard some interest in art opportunities. One, you know, people have thought of basketball courts as one big canvas um, or a mural. That's a, a, an opportunity here. And we know we also wanna talk about the court lighting being on timers and having glare control um, and talk about the pros and cons of that. Then also in terms of enhancing park programming, talk about a dog park. Um, there's design considerations we need to consider. We generally think, you know, it should be centrally located so it's accessible, not on top of the hill, um, that it needs to be a fenced in space. It shouldn't be located next to the playground or a school. It should be at least 50 feet from a residential property line and that it should be about 5,000 square feet minimum. Now the 5,000 square feet is something we've We've researched some of that is based on um, outside of the region examples, but we have a list here of Boston area dog parks and their sizes. 
in the north end, one that's a DiFilippo Park, 6,500 square feet. There's another one, Richmond Street, which is only 3,300. You know, it's basically a, it's, it's like a big bocce court. Um, Peters Park in the south end, which is closer to 10,000 square feet, similarly with East First Street. Uh, and then the others I mentioned here that range from under 5,000 to Tudor Park, which is 11,000. So what does that mean for this park? We looked at a number of different options where we could meet those criteria. And I'll go in more detail about each one of these, but there's six options here. Um, they all meet the 5,000 square foot minimum um, that we talked about. They're more than 50 feet away from a residence and centrally, centrally located and can be accessible. So the first one is closer, this is Gordon Street. That's the proposed realigned walkway that would be accessible. And it's a narrow dog park that still is 50 feet away from residences and is more than 5,000 square feet. It's not the most centrally located, but um, it's certainly feasible. Another location which is more involved in, hear me out here for a second because there's a lot of moving parts. The dog park goes where the playground is. It's fenced in, it's centrally located, but kind of removed from other uses. Then the play area gets combined in ex in as an expanded play area over at the Jackson Man, all in one area. And then the Little League field gets converted to a rectangular multi-use field and the paths get realigned. So there's a lot of moving parts on that one, but that yields a dog park that's fairly large. Another idea is the playground remains as it is. The dog park takes over left field basically, but would be fenced in. And then there would be a multi-use rectangular field in the remainder of the Little League field. Another option, rotate that multi-use field. Dog park is more on the Southern part of basically where the um, backstop and the bleachers are. And one that doesn't require changing the Little League field basically is behind the backstop and that still stays more than 50 feet away from residences and is centrally located. So we covered a lot of ground. Thank you for being patient and listening. Um, and I know some of you have questions in the Q&A and I think this is where the chance, the chance where we open it up to you all to hear your comments and talk through some of these ideas. Thanks, Kyle, uh, Danielle. Um, so I'm going to quickly just review how you can raise your hand. Uh, there's a, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see raise hand icon. You can raise that and that will indicate to us that uh, you'd like to say something. I see a couple of raised hands already, so that's great. Um, if there's anybody on the phone, I'm going to try to prioritize them over uh, people who are uh, joined through their computer. Uh, you can also put Q&As in the Q&A box. Um, I've uh, answered a few of them as we've been going through the presentation, um, said, put a pin in others that we'll talk about. Um, so we'll get, to, we'll get to those as well. Um, as we want to be respectful of all those voices. Yep. Sorry, do you want to do it once you get started? Do you want to do two um, live and then answer the? Yeah, we'll see how it goes, how many, how many uh, people want to speak and how many people um, have comments in there. So we'll, we'll work through that as we go. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's have uh, Nancy Grilk. I'm gonna un allow you to unmute yourself. Um, oh, did I just, I may have, okay. Nancy, can you go ahead. Thank you everybody. Um, thanks for all your work. Um, I have a question about um, all the, the relocating uh, of things. Um, first of all, I live, I bought the, uh, near the tennis courts. I'm on the, just on the other side of the street from the tennis and basketball courts and um, adding performance space and a dog park in that area would be really disruptive. And I just, just want to get out. Yeah, it's very residential on this side. Um, but I wonder, um, uh, I've been working uh, with the group of people and, and folks on the, uh, the lighting of the park and there should be the light pylons. Uh, they're not proposed, they are actually going to go in and there will be some, the signage will go in at all the five entrances and, uh, I, you know, with the ground being frozen, I'm not sure when that'll take place. But um, 
But I, I wonder about some of these changes and how that can be done, given that the park has received land and water conservation funding, and I know they're um, they're difficult to move on on changing the use from passive to, to anything else. So I wonder how how that would work. Thank you. Um, that's a great great question, Nancy. And I think the we have a lot of parks that have land and water conservation grants. Um, have, they've received them in the past. And I don't know that there is a restriction on them. There, I'm sorry, but when change. we were working on, on locating some of the, um, the artwork in the park, we were looking to do it on the slope um, where you're talking about the pollinator. And we were told that that could not be, just, that could not be changed from a passive um, uh, from passive recreation to anything else. So, okay, uh, I'll, I will investigate that. Yeah, yeah, they were, they were, I'm sure that they were very. That were, were okay. With that. As a follow up, if that's okay while we're here. Hi. Yep. Okay. Uh, one comment first, uh, Mr. Zick. I said I think believe said that trucks can get around the plane, uh, the courts, sports courts, the maintenance trucks. Mm -hmm. Uh, where I live, I watch them just about daily. Whenever they pick up trash over by Gordon Street, they drive back up sometimes, sometimes drive forward, big trucks, small trucks. And if you walk there, you'll see the broken sidewalks that aren't that old. They do that repeatedly, wreck the sidewalks. So that's just a clarification. Uh, the circle that you talk about on the end of Emory Street, really? Emory Road, uh, Actually, that's part of an earlier master plan going back, I don't know, 25, 30 years. The neighborhood asked for that circle to keep it grassy and plain for people to gather. Uh, the police asked for it so they could get emergency vehicle, police and fire, so they could get ambulance and whatever if they're needed through there. It's not blocked. Now we have a problem. There's a group called the Vikings. They go there every weekend and they kill all the grass around there. They do their stuff with plastic swords and whatever and it seems harmless but they do kill the grass and I don't think I'm not sure if they're permitted maybe somebody at parks can find out um, adults in play areas I thought there was a policy where unless you're there with kids you don't go in a play area for obvious reasons that's just a comment they're talking about doing stuff more stuff in uh, play areas I don't I only heard passingly about rain gardens. Couldn't that be one of the ways of dealing with uh, some of the erosion problems? If you walk out of the park or the front of the Jackson Man School, I hope you've already seen it, there is a wonderful rain garden built there by Water and Sewer about a year ago. Uh, they don't take up much space, they keep trees. Um, and lights in the courts. Nancy and I have lived here since, 24 years, when we moved in, the lights on the court were out. They came on for a while accidentally, apparently, maybe 15, 20 years ago. We got a petition, the late city council, Brian Honan, uh, sent it to the late park commissioner, Justine Lith, and the lights were turned out and they've been off since. We're used to that. And because I live across the street, uh, any time of the day or night, somebody is using those courts. Not tennis so much, although I watched them in the snow today, but basketball in the dark, 3 a.m., 3 a.m., whatever. Uh, when the lights were on accidentally till 11 for a while, first of all, I blasted all our windows around there. There's a lot of homes around there. And uh, it attracted people that weren't playing basketball. They were screwing around, making trouble. <laughs> so it was an attractive nuisance, I think. Uh, so and uh, so yeah. they were re the last thing about the lights. A lot, the parks department spent a lot of money about a year ago restoring them. They're the same. I talked to the electrician on the site. He said these should have never been fixed up. They're, they light the sky. They're inefficient. They use up a lot of juice and therefore money. Yet there they sit. Uh, they should be removed. We don't need lights there. That's it for now. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. You raised a lot of a lot of questions and I um, are a lot of good points. And I want to make sure that um, that we are addressing them to the extent that we can. Um, the first, you know, I think the the passive area that or the, the performance space 
um, you know, central area that that was definitely a designed area. And um, I think we just want to we see it as an area that has potential. Um, and how can we work within that um, within that area to improve it and and provide an additional asset to the community? Um, you know, is there a way that we can accommodate more than one thing in this area? Um, can we accommodate the use that the the Irish Vikings are are using it for, or find another location for them that does not affect the grass? So we're just trying to to explore some of those ideas with that. Um, you know, designs change, people change, neighborhoods change. We want to bring that up, bring that use up to um, to what today and tomorrow will be. So you know, 20, 25 years ago that worked well, um, or maybe worked kind of well and has worked less well as of late. And what can we do to, to reflect what's um, what's happening today? Um, I recognize that as a department, as a maintenance, um, we do our best to gain access to the areas that are harder to access just because we drive on a pathway does not mean that it's actually wide enough for us to drive on. Um, so if we can widen the pathway by one or two feet, that may uh, eliminate some of that cracking that is happening and making sure that that pathway is heavy duty enough that it can accommodate that vehicular, uh, that vehicular pathway. Um, so I think I do wanna get into some of the questions about the lighting, because I think as you know, we heard a lot from the community last time and, and through our survey that there is a desire to have, uh, to play basketball in this court after hours. Um, and I'd like to dig in a little more to this. Um, so some, I understand that some of the abutters, not just Bob, but some of the abutters don't want lights on the basketball court, but many basketball users would like additional time, especially in the summer, to get out of the house, uh, blow off some steam and participate in a healthy activity. So um, specifically to the neighbors, what are the concerns about turning on lights during the summer hours, which is typically Memorial Day to Labor Day, um, and the lights are on a timer that they would go off at 1030. And that is a policy um, that the Parks Department has. We certainly have, we've made accommodations in other, other locations. Um, so I, I would like to hear from the community about whether that, um, what the specific concerns are about those lights. Um, so, uh, Bob and Nancy, I'm gonna unmute you one more time. Um, if you could somehow, um, I don't know if people can indicate a way that they can, if they're in a butter and have a comment about that, specifically about that. But Nancy, you can go ahead. Okay, yes, we're, we live across, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We live across the street and uh, <laughs> they want playing time in the summer. Believe me, they play 24 hours a day on that basketball court. Uh, you guys should probably come over to our home and visit sometime. We'll give you a cup of coffee. You can watch it. Tennis, not so much because some of it probably gets hit in the face if it's too dark. But summertime, what do we have? 14 hours of light? The neighbors should get a break. And adding something, I'm going to switch gears a little here to, to a dog park, which would probably have lights, is another nuisance for the people that live around here. They always say, well, you moved in next to a park. You knew that. Yeah, well, there wasn't a dog park and there weren't lights actually. They were there, but they weren't turned on. Uh, they're intrusive. Uh, and the fact is they use these courts all the time without lights. There's no leagues. And there's no leagues, so they don't play, they don't need them. Uh, and it saved the park some money. Maybe you guys can get a little raise if those mm. lights, all that electricity, <laughs> but thank you. My, my salary is not tied to, uh, to energy savings. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on to uh, Councilor Braden. I'm going to allow you to talk and unmute yourself. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and unfortunately, I am in in the meeting for a very short time. I have another meeting to go to, uh, but I'm really impressed with all the great work that you folks have doing are doing and the the level of community participation and outreach. So, 
Um, please let us know. Uh, my chief of staff, Pam Mullaney, is here as well. So um, just uh, let us know if we can help in any way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Um, I'm going to, were there other comments in the Q&A about, um, about the basketball? Um, they played basketball all hours after night, all night. Um, um, I'm going to read this from Margaret O'Connell. Need lights just because neighbors are now used to darkness doesn't mean it can stay dark forever. And I think that's what we're trying to explore. Um, are there are there some modifications that we can make? Is the issue primarily around glare, um, which can we can solve help solve through um, through sharp cutoffs and LEDs that works well in other locations. Um, the lights are very bright. It usually takes one to three hours after the lights go off before the crowds disperse. And I think that that's um, that's a great point. And we can um, we can work with the with the police and try to monitor that. Um, and the light levels could be adjusted through. There's technology that it it can it can be um, instant on and instant off um, through a remote access. Um, I live off the park with and with the tennis court lights shining in my bedroom window, I haven't found any concerns with curtains or noise. Um, the language gets dramatically worse as it gets dark. That's another great, great point for us to consider. Also more pot smoked the later we get. Um, as a resident living half a block away, the lights on the court would be hugely beneficial to those walking through the park at night and hoping to utilize the space during the summer months. I know there were many nights this summer when I saw peaceful, quiet community gatherings that would have loved some extra light. So thank you for that comment. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's try to move on to some other comments. I'm gonna, Hallie, I'm gonna allow you to talk and make your comments. Okay. Um, hi. <laughs> I'm, I'm Hallie. I live in Austin about half a mile from the park. Um, I work in environmental education and sustainable urban li living. And I recently partnered with a nonprofit organization called the Urban Garden Initiative. And so we implement these community gardens and then use them as like a catalyst for programming and workshops and community service events, art projects, etc. And I can provide much more detail about this, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. Overall, I and other enthusiastic members of the community are hoping that Ringer Park may be a possible location for the community garden for the Boston chapter. And I was just wondering if this was plausible or if we could talk about it more. Um, I think there was another comment about wanting the community garden. Um, and I think we'd have to get a sense of what Know, really what the feeling is, but also what the uh, physical size requirements for a community garden is. I know this feels like there's an endless amount of space, but there's quite a bit of tree cover here, a lot of topography, um, and trying to fit that program in, we just need to get a better sense of what the, what the community, what the size for a community garden like that would be. Um, so if you have any information about that, that would be helpful. I'm trying to think okay. about um, some of the other community gardens that we have in the city and what the size is. And they do take up quite a bit of space. Um, you well, know, it definitely is like a, a flexible um, size because it doesn't have to be like one of those huge plots that everyone has their own space. It's just like basically just like, um, like a home base <laughs> for programming stuff. So even if it's just like a couple of those gardening boxes that are, you know, like, um, maybe like four feet by four feet, just like a few of those or something like that. Like not like a huge space or anything, just something where there could be um, some gardening happening, I guess. Yeah, so if you, to have, do collectively. if you have more information, um, I think we would wanna have a pretty firm um, commitment from a group to move forward with that. Yeah. Um, and we typically do have um, community gardening partners that help manage those spaces because without any kind of you know management uh, from 
from an outside group, we're we don't we're not able to provide that level of service of you know assigning plots or making sure that everybody's represented in a fair and equitable way. So um, it's something we can we're happy to have a further conversation with with you okay. or anyone else who's interested in it. Yep. Yeah, because we would um, definitely be able to talk about like like we have um, ideas in place to make sure that like longevity occurs and it's not just left for to be dealt with in like a couple of years or something. Um, so yeah, I'd love to talk. Greenwood Park isn't necessarily the first spot that comes to mind um, for community gardens, but depending on the size, it may be possible or uh, or not. Um, there are a lot of other sites in Alston that are are uh, would be easier to incorporate that into. Um, so if it's not ringer specific, we can have that conversation as well. Okay, thank you so much. That's all okay, thanks. Okay, Marta, you've been very patient, thank you. You can unmute yourself. Oh, hi, thank you, no problem. I'm happy to wait. Hi, my name is Marta. I'm uh, living, I live on Armington Street, just off of the park of the, the Webley entrance. I'm a mother to a six-year-old who was raised in Ringer Park. Um, thank you so much for all the work that you've done uh, in presenting this to us. It's very helpful to be able to talk through. Um, I do appreciate the entrance improvements. They look really good, um, definitely helpful uh, to not have those weird pylons sticking out everywhere um, while you try to get through with your bike. Um, road service improvements sound really good. Um, I like the idea of the main artery through the, the urban area to be better paved so you can actually um, I mean, currently I have a, a newborn at home um, that is staying with us right now and I have a stroller. I'm like, okay, that's off the charge for me right now, but with a stroller or with improvement that could uh, be possible as well. Um, then um, a couple of questions I had um, in regards to fitness objects in the playground, like what the first gentleman, I believe Bob what, was mentioning, um, it would bring adults into the playground that probably would, you know, it can be fun, but at the same time, sometimes um, adults do come into the playground area to use the monkey bars or the equipment to do their workout. And sometimes it create, creates a little bit of an uncomfortable atmosphere when I come there with my young child. Um, uh, they will, you know, kind of take up that particular part of the play area and she's, we cannot go and play there because that feels uncomfortable or in, especially over the last summer during the pandemic, the, the people who would do their exercise would not be wearing their masks so we couldn't get anywhere close. Um, so yeah, if the fitness can kind of stay aside, like I appreciate fitness um, opportunities in the park, I think that's fun, but maybe separate from the playground area. Um, uh, I do, um, oh, the community park uh, garden, what the lady was saying, I, I remember uh, behind the Jackson Man, they had a little bit like a school community garden. They had for a while, they like over the summer or like the spring semester, they would plant, they had those boxes, but they would be left to themselves during the summer. Uh, but maybe that is a space that could be used for it. Uh, it does get very sunny, especially now that a couple trees have been taken down that were there. So um, that might be a nice location to grow some things. Um, and if, if potentially the playground gets moved to that area, then that could also kind of be all incorporated. Um, for myself, I'm trying to find out, do I, you know, the, play, the location of the playground where it is. I like that it is a little bit away from everything since it doesn't invite for just anybody to come in. You just go there when you have a purpose. Um, and it's kind of half shade during the summer. There's nice tree, the, you know, the nice trees. So at some point in the afternoon during the summer, you can actually go there and you can find a little bit of shade where if you would move the playground to behind the Jackson Man or like part of the field there, it's it's way more open. It might just get too hot. Um, so those would be some considerations. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for, for the rest. Um, this is kind of what I wanted to bring in. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, um, Dave Vance, I'm gonna allow you to talk. You can. Unmute yourself. I think I've done the right person. I may have. Oh, you know what? I did Jay Whittier 26. Um, I think I unmuted yourself. Okay. Uh, you, you should be able to unmute yourself now and then I'll do Dave next. Yeah. Hello? Yes. 
Hi, um, I'm Brianna Richardson, and this is my mom. I, we live on 35 Emory Road. So I just wanted to, uh, this is a great meeting, and also just a little tidbit about the basketball court. Um, I think that even though a lot of people do play there, and sometimes it can get noisy or just a lot during the summer, it's also a great area that brings a lot of young people and vibrancy to our park. And I think I walk, I walk my dog a lot at night, and sometimes when there's not a lot of light around there, it kind of just, it's not a safe place to be. And I think when you have light, it, your light into the night, it also is, makes it a very safe environment as well. But when you take away that light and take away all the light in the possibility of light in the park, you know, that kind of cuts the times for people to really congregate and also have vibrant, vibrant fellowship there too. Okay. And this is her mom, the last thing. Um, Janine Witter and a butter on Emory Road. So the point is, is I'm looking at this bigger picture. It seems like 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when we moved here, it was a different type of park. Uh, it sounds to me like this plan is trying to change the park into a more uh, young professional wanting to exercise and release. Um, so that's something that the community has to agree to, um, which I'm hearing there's still a split. I do believe that the children's area should be separated. I raise a child in that park as well. It should not be over by the basketball court or tennis court because it's too open to Gordon Street as well as the meth clinic up the street. Um, definitely needs to be separated. And also the exercise activity area near the children's playground is a risk liability to the city as well. And that really needs to be reevaluated and switched out altogether. Doesn't make good sense at all. Um, I think that also it's a liability. The exercise area is a liability because a lot of it's low. Some of the exercise equipment, even though it's not a lot, was a bit higher so that people couldn't like trip over it, stumble over it, fall off of it. Because what happens at night, although we don't want to admit it, there are young people out there at night playing around. And somebody's going to get hurt with that low stuff. It's, it, I think it's too much of a liability. So unless they move the exercise equipment to an area that's not that's not as accessible, or move the exercise equipment and make it a little bit higher, it's going to be a lot of mess. And the last thing I want to say that hasn't really been said is about again the Vikings. I know that that brings a lot of people enjoyment, but it is a problem for people who want to bring their young kids because, or young families, because of the fact that um, it's, it's aggressive and it's a little scary for the young people. I think that we had to decide whether we want this to be a play area for adults or a play area for young people, like kids. Uh, so, you know, I, I personally have a problem with that. I think that that, um, I don't think that necessarily we should just design a park based on one group's activity. If there's a space that they can use, I'm all for it. But I, I'm not sure about designing a certain portion just to accommodate that group. That's so I think that's a that's a great point. And uh and I but I think we want to um to make sure that we're not uh designing a space that will be used by a group that would just would negatively impact the work that we just did right so if we were to put like just for an example like if you put sod down in that circle area because you know these users are are here mm -hmm. um that will that will affect that the viability of that newly installed sod right so can can we design a space that's flexible enough to accommodate users of this type. And as the park users change, could we accommodate users of a different type? Right. That's just what we're exploring. Right, that's how I look at it. Right, so it's not, this box over here is solely for this park user. And if they stop using it, then it's just gonna disappear, right? That's what we're trying to avoid. Right, and I- want to design that... flexible spaces that can accommodate both existing and future park users right so that's what it has become so right. I just guard against that you know let it be flexible for others and not right, right 
bank in the middle of the entrance. Right. So those are some of the things we want to explore with this plan. So that's great. So thank you sir, very much for your comments. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Dave Vance, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself. Hi, thanks, Kathy. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's been, I think you guys have done a great job and I, I appreciate all of the, the plan so far. I love to play tennis at the park. Uh, we're, my wife and I are dog owners, so we, we love the idea of a dog park there. And, um, I have my proposal uh, is one that's not really been talked about much, but I think there's space in the four acres of urban wild for like a skills, some cycling features for families, um, for people of all ages, something that would kind of supplement the the pump track, the Smith playground, uh, but be in more of an urban or like a, a natural setting that would have uh, features that kids could learn to ride bikes on and uh, would be just something fun to liven up that space and uh, promote its safe use. I think that that's something that could be done really well and not really uh, take away from that natural space or uh, inhibit any other uses of the park. Thanks. Thanks. We'll, we'll, uh, I think you, you can probably see from the survey that uh, the urban wild is very well loved and very well used as it is. Um, and changing the use um, may change the management of that quite a bit. So we just want to make sure that we're, um, we're designing something that we can maintain into the future. So thank you. Uh, Whitney, I will allow you to unmute yourself. Uh, greetings and thank you. Uh, let me put my picture on. All right, forget that. Um, Dave Vance, I love that idea. Outdoor obstacle course. Let me add that. I could see that. And um, um, Marla and Haley Cooper, yes, on the gardens. And yeah, I, I have been wanting that area that Marla mentioned. Uh, I have been wanting to do exactly that and re um, start what was there, uh, which uh, I think Haley might be able to find out more about. Um, now, my main concern, I'm a safety engineer and um, I'm kind of confused as to why we're not working with the city's engineers um, and uh, because uh, and the maintenance crew who's already in there, who has experience with what the actual situation is. So and, we've, um, we've coordinated, so I, um, I just wanna explain our process a bit. Um, yeah, we please, have, thank you. I've, I've, we've had many conversations with the maintenance department. We met with the, the maintenance four person on site, walked the whole site with him, got an understanding of how he accesses the park, where he sees some of the low areas, where he sees problems, and just get a sense of what, what the concerns are from his perspective. We're gonna continue to vet our plan with the maintenance department so that we're make, we make sure that any improvements that we make, uh, they support, they think will improve their workflow. As a department, um, you know, we're, we're the parks department, we have a chief engineer. There's also the public works department. They have engineers in-house, but uh, the public facilities department also does design work. All of us hire design teams that we think best match their skills with the problems that we know of and potentially don't know of. Um, so we hire design consultants to study a wide variety of problems. Mm -hmm. um, to help us address those issues. We're talking at a very broad level here yeah. about some of the drainage issues. Some of them are very specific about this area gets wet, um, but we do, we are also simultaneously taking a very big picture look uh, and working through uh, consulting with the Boston Water and Sewer Department, Absolutely. our sewer commission, 
when we get to specific site plan improvements, they have also identified sites that they would like to prioritize um, right. some green infrastructure with. This is one of those I need to dig into more about exactly why that is, because when I look at this site, I see a lot of ledge, which means to leads me to believe there's not a whole lot of room for uh, for subsurface infiltration. So those are the, some of the big engineering problems that we're, we're looking at and considering. Um, most of the time we don't get into that kind of granular level of, of specific site plan improvements. Just know that all of the improvements are going to be looked at and considered through that uh, drainage lens. We're going to be infiltrating uh, impervious the first inch of rain throughout the throughout the park for any impervious surfaces that we're adding. So those are all kind of the regulatory behind the scenes things that we as a city are doing to improve the drainage throughout the city. Okay, because the, the real concern here is the rodents. Okay? okay, this is this is the real safety issue. Health wise, you know, rodents, which and, and even talking about anything else before we get we take care of this one huge problem. It's just it's just kind of seems hard for me to wrap my head around. So I just okay. So all we right. will we will include <laughs> rodent control in, in our in our construction projects for sure. Right. Um, some of that is stuff that happens beyond the boundaries of the park that we're not able to um, to address. But I will um, I'll reach out to ISD and see if there's if they know of some problem sites that we could work together on to try to to um, yeah. address the road issue. Well, that, yeah. That's what the the scientists are for. <laughs> that's what the engineers know how to do. So let's yeah. let's use the people that have the skills. Thank you. That's okay. all I. <laughs> um, I'm going to read a couple. I want to get a couple of questions about. Look, like there were a couple of questions about the uh, fields that I just want to touch on. Um, could the multi-use field be shaped more organically as well, or does it have to be strictly rectangular? So when we're looking at um, how the the field lays out on in the site, we want to understand the rectangular limits of that. Um, but it doesn't mean that there wouldn't be, couldn't, wouldn't, or couldn't be an organic. Uh, edge to that, but we want to understand what's the maximum size of on the field of play that we can get in this site. Um, I think there was another one about the um, field. Maybe that was the only one. Um, I've been I've been promoting a multi-use synthetic little league baseball soccer where the baseball field is located. The little league field has been long underfunded. It would be great to, for the schools to have soccer, Little League, baseball, and softball. The dog park is funny to propose due to so much woods and areas that are remote, but that's a new movement. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and I, I've done several artificial turf fields throughout the city. I don't usually like to do Little League artificial turf fields. Um, but I think it's something that, as a comprehensive plan, as a master plan, that's maybe something we, that we should um, look at and consider, I think, before we move forward on any uh, on a field improvement like that, we would re-engage the community and talk about uh, artificial turf. Um, I think that was, let me just make sure that the, field comments are pretty widely, um, pretty much addressed. And I'm gonna allow Michael Dorgan to make a comment. So Michael, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Should be all set. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I appreciate all of the work that's gone into this and it certainly um, you know looks like some promising developments. Um, you know, I have one topic that I want to talk about relative to the dogs, and then my daughter wanted to talk about the, uh, you know, the basketball courts. Um, and again, we're in a butter, we live right next to the uh, courts. Um, you know, in terms of the dog park, I mean, it would be nice to keep it somewhat separated from other uh, public activities. I know, you know, many times the dogs are kind of out of control. 
Um, they'll jump on you, uh, especially after they come out of um, the park area. Um, so I think like intermixing it with some of the other um, public areas would be uh, um, you know, a problem. You know, today, oftentimes if you wanna use the ballpark, it's kind of hard to get the dog people to get off of it. And in theory, you know, today it's, it's illegal for them to have dogs in that area. I mean, there's a sign right on, um, the on the fence that indicates that. So um, they ignore it. yeah, it's, it's completely ignored at this point. Uh, Sam, you want to talk about the? Okay. Oh, what are we saying? Hi, uh, I'm Sam Dorgan. I grew up in the park. Um, about the the basketball lights, it keeps me up at night, especially when they're they're being rowdy. Um, Good. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I think that that is, um, why don't I dig into some of these comments about the dog parks um, that were in the questions and I am way behind in, in some of these questions. Um, why can't the dog park continue to be fenced in ballpark? Currently it's very, a very nice community that use that. Um, and, I think as Michael was refer was uh, was saying, currently the ball field is not supposed to be a dog park. If you think about it, um, the kids play there. If someone doesn't uh, doesn't clean up after their their dog, kids can step in in dog waste. It's not it's not a compatible use. Similar to how we we do uh, ban dogs from play areas from fenced in play areas. Um, so I understand that it is a great community. Um, they self-police, they, they uh, talk to neighbors who have not been conscientious about cleaning up after their dogs, um, but it, it's, it's not an ideal mix of uses. So um, we're raising the question, is there a way that we can separate these uses, that we could provide a fenced in dog area for off-leash dogs for the neighborhood to decrease that activity on the ball field. Um, so uh, the current de facto dog park is full size of the playing field. As someone who comes here every day with my dog, I can tell you that is by far the most active part of the park year round. Current plans look like they shrink the dog park significantly. Um, and that is a, that's a great, great point. Um, we're looking, the sizes that we're showing are based on, um, other dog parks and in other neighborhoods throughout the city of Boston. Um, just as a just as a reference, so that's just so you can get a sense of what uh, what what that would be. It doesn't mean it's going to be exactly that size. Um, I will say that we're planning uh, a dog park for Smith Playground that will be constructed starting this spring. Uh, it will take about a year for it to be constructed, um, and that will be significantly larger. So this might be a neighborhood sized dog park with Smith being, you know, a, a more of a regional, might be a weekend walk, um, but for every day, 5,000 square feet in a, in a dense neighborhood seems to be uh, working. Um, if there are, let me see if there's other dog park comments. I'm scanning these. Any more info about how the dog parts park spot will be chosen I didn't want a dog park, but I realized we needed, I think 5,000 is about right fenced away from the ball field. Um, so yeah, so I think as we sort through some of these issues, um, determining whether we're gonna be converting this to a, um, to a multi-purpose field instead of a little league field, that's a conversation we're gonna have with our permitting department to see what the needs are. Um, and that may drive some of these decisions. I think we have some preferred sites and some less preferred sites. I'm not sure uh, the Gordon Street side works very well, but we did want to show that to you because it was raised at the last meeting um, and to just make sure that we're, we are considering it. It's, it's long and skinny, which isn't ideal. Um, dogs are not out of control. There are way more dog owners in the community than little league players. Uh, the dog park near Gordon Street sounds good. Um, it is a separate place for dog owners and their dogs that congregate. Um, I don't know whether it's 
Griff, um, Christine, I think maybe is trying to get my attention. No. <laughs> um, I don't know, Kyle, if you want to go back, if you're able to go back to those dog park site plan alternatives. And these are just, these were fit, kind of a fit, um, fit models to see what you could get in each of these areas. Um, so we're using a 5,000 square feet as a minimum. All right, um, Dan, I'm gonna allow you to unmute yourself and make a comment. Thank you. Um, wow, thank you, everybody. Great job. Um, enjoy the upgrades to the majority of the field. And I was the one who wrote the comment on the multi-use synthetic field. Um, I have, I grew up in the area, member of the West End House Boys and Girls Club, um, worked at the Jackson Man School, um, ran softball leagues out of that field, um, played BNBL on the basketball field. So lifelong Brighton resident. What I just think would be sensational, and I, I'm sorry to disagree with the dog owners, and I um, echo your response, Kathy, on you can't have the dogs in the baseball field. It's a softball field. And the reason that the baseball declined as a former athletic director with the Jacks Man and working in the West End House and then working in the high schools, neighborhood high schools, the reason is because the softball field just became too run down. It wasn't upgraded. It just was never um, brought to standard um, for MIAA use or any formal league. So I would propose, and I just throwing it out there to take a look of a multi synthetic field. A lot of uh, people in the neighborhood play soccer. Um, there's some wonderful soccer leagues out of the Jackson Man's community center. Uh, could really use that. And if it could be a multi use field that incorporated what's already there softball, little league baseball, and add soccer, that would be ideal to me for improvements. But Again, I, it's a big park. There's a lot of usage, and that's just the one that I'm passionate about. I think, unfortunately, I, you know, I don't think the dog users. I think they've been fortunate that the park's so run down, and they've kind of taken it over. And yes, it's a hot spot for dog use. God bless you guys, but that's not the intent of that area. And unfortunately, it's ruined the field for the other uses. So, as you said, Kathy, you got to have a separate usage. And I appreciate that comment. Thank you. Thanks. Um, the other the other consideration that um, I just want to add to the field configuration is some of the um, the other planning and upcoming design improvements that will be happening throughout the neighborhood um, and working with the community groups that do permit those fields and understanding their demands as well. Um, Demand and usage, not demands as in, give it to me. Um, so, uh, Manon, I'm going to allow you to talk. I don't think you have, uh, I don't think we've heard from you yet. Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you. Does this work? Yep. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you for addressing the comment about the, the dog. So I am a dog owner um, and I wanted to second some of the comments that have been posted about you know, really good self-policing community, um, a lot of usage. If you went to the park tonight, for example, it's essentially deserted apart from the dog uh, spaces. So I'm looking at the um, the existing plans. Um, I think it, I understand how the dog space is comparative to other uh, such urban areas. I'm wondering whether um, given the extent of the community and the number of people who who do bring their dogs and who do enjoy this community, we might consider, uh, you know, having it slightly larger than average, uh, just because a lot of these people are people who do live in the neighborhood. It's not quite the same thing as needing to own a car to drive far away to go to a larger dog park. So that's just something I've mentioned, but I do want to thank kind of the, the planning uh, team for putting and thinking about dog spaces in here because I know it's been something that's been asked for a lot. 
Um, on some of the other points, just wanted to weigh in a little bit. I agree with some of the comments on the fact that lights in the playing field maintain safety. Um, you know, as a woman walking through the park at night, it helps a lot to have some lights on. So I'm, I'm, I understand that the uh, residents and the abooters um, don't, you know, it's not their preference. I understand that. However, for the safety of the rest of the community and the people who are using these fields, it is kind of important. Um, so are you saying, are you asking whether we should be lighting the fields as well as the courts or just the courts? The courts, the courts. Okay. Um, okay. And also for the urban wildlife area, I think it's wonderful to be maintaining it in its, well, in its kind of wild aspects. Um, some light through that forest might help a lot with some of the behaviors and kind of dodgy feeling of it. So that would also help a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, um, I'm gonna see if I can get through a couple of these comments. Um, there's a question about um, that I'm not sure. Maybe Danielle, maybe you can answer this. For the 60% of the people, Neil's not here. 60% people who indicated they regularly enjoyed the urban wild, was that 60% of 152 responses or 60% of the people who answered the question? 50% that answered the question. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I think the I think the urban wild area could use investigation as far as native species and variety of plants, then replant, remove the undesirable ones. This would require expertise from an expert, and that is definitely something that we are uh, looking for. Um, we're going to be including um, in our recommendations for this plan, and then when we get to the urban wild um, capital work including that work as a as a specialty inventorying all of the, the trees is probably part of it um, removing the, the declining trees getting an arborist out there having them consult um, so we can identify um, some of the larger issues right now but then as we get into that capital work really drilling down into this tree needs to be removed this tree even though it is looks like it's in decline, you know, maybe there's pruning we can do to work on that. Um, so those are the kinds of specific recommendations that we'll get into when we get to that piece of uh, capital implementation. Um, uh, I'm gonna allow Joseph Rowland, who we haven't heard from yet to talk, and then um, I will uh, get to the other people who have their hands raised. So you should be able to, yeah, perfect. Hello, uh, thank you. I, I have comments about park improvements, but uh, I would like to address a misconception about Ringer Park that I see all the time. I didn't see it mentioned in this pre presentation or the last one, um, but the, the Ringer Park Facebook page says it a lot. Uh, it's commonly claimed that Frederick Law Olmsted designed Ringer Park, but that is, that's not true. Uh, he's the guy who designed Central Park and, and the Emerald Necklace. Um, he died in 1903 and the park became a park in 1916. So just based off that, we know it's not true. And the confusion about this, I think, comes in because uh, his, his sons carried on the firm and they were consulted in 1916 when they were making a park. So if you go online on the, the Library of Congress website, their, their letters are on there and like all of their ideas for the park are included and like they had some they had some weird ideas basically they wanted to to connect the the rock formations in ringer park with like stone walls and then fill it in so the 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 hilltop became like this flat space and uh yeah lots of crazy ideas that are kind of hard to imagine now because the west end house is there uh but yeah, none of their ideas were used. So I think, so you don't have to worry about, um, I don't know, disturbing like sacred park design in this park here. Uh, and and yeah, also- It's not a historic, capital H historic park. Um, it's an old park, but it's not historic and uh, it's not landmark. So there's no uh, historic re regulatory reviews that we need to go through to make these improvements. Exactly. Yeah. And also, I want to say, I said this in my uh, Q&A 
thing, but uh, I want to repeat it. I think a, a public bathroom would be a really great addition to this park. Uh, Alston only has one other public bathroom, so uh, I don't know. There's there's a need there, especially now with like lots of I don't know when this would happen, of course, but um, like public like bathrooms and restaurants and stuff are less open right now. So I think there's that lots of people would benefit. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So thank you for that comment. Um, as a as a department, we don't want to be adding things that we can't maintain. And unfortunately, bathrooms fall into that category of things that are really necessary, but we're not able to provide from a um, provide in a safe manner at this point, but um, but we can include that that comment um, and recommendation in our master plan. Um, I we're about seven forty five, and I, I want to just give us you know start thinking about wrapping up. So I'm going to unmute um, Jay Whittier twenty six one more time, uh, and uh, and hello. Go ahead. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to comment about the dog park. Um, I've been a dog owner for 13 years and I grew up here and the having a dog space in Ringer Park has always been a point of contention in our neighborhood because of the use of the uh, baseball, softball fields. Um, but, you know, that's in dog, dog owners and the pets that we have are really important to this community, but also like the baseball softball park, whichever it is called, um, you know, has been taken over by that one group, which isn't fair to the kids and teams that used to frequent that space because I've been around here for so long. I'm 22 years old now and there used to be a lot more kids who used to play in that area and a lot of people don't. And I think that, you know, there has always been a need for there to be a space for dog owners to congregate because it is a community. It's always been a community. And also for dogs to be able to run around in a fenced in area. And I think we should really prioritize that going forward so that there can this park can really now be a, a place where everyone can find solace and a space to be. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Nancy and Bob, I'm gonna allow you to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, could you go to the slide that shows pictures of existing dog parks, please? Okay. Locations. Uh. And uh, this presentation will be may already be up on the website on the uh, Rainer so Park website, but but just so you just your. So this is uh, my question: Is what kind of surfaces are we seeing in these dogs? Is that uh, crushed rock or gravel or? Yeah, so the um, Peters Park is a pea stone. Um, DeFilippo, which Kyle's office worked on, is an artificial turf actually uh, over some existing brick. That's a very challenging site. Mm -hmm. um, the East First Street is, uh, is a gravel that is called a rice stone. And that's actually what we're looking to, to replicate at Smith um, in the next uh, project. Uh, speaking of Smith, what is the size of that, please? The dog park. Uh, the dog park at Smith is uh, is larger. I think it's about fourteen thousand square feet. So three times. And it has a small dog area and a large dog area. And the small dog's about thirty-seven, and the large dog is whatever the balance of that. Hardiman, not only ten thousand. In Hardiman is a dog park. Uh, Commonly known as Tar Park. You know, yeah, I don't know if that's an official dog park or not. Um, well, it sure is used as one. <laughs> yeah, so, so, absolutely. I mean, um, as yeah. is Ringer, right? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and a dog park would take a water source, right? You it requires a water source, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and who would pay for the capital cost of putting in a dog park? Um. So the we used to have a policy where it would be. Um, fundraised by a, a friends group. Um, that's still a model that we would love to replicate if there's a friends group that would like to come to, come together um, and uh, that would commit to maintaining it um, and doing you know periodic cleanups. That's a great model to replicate. Um, 
we have been more flexible with that um, in terms of having a, a strict monetary commitment uh, from the friends group if there is a friends group that comes forward. Um, there is also a very generous foundation that is specifically interested in dog parks, which we have installed uh, a few of uh, in the city and um, they require, they, they match a quite a large amount of, of funding. No, um, huge and separated. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, I thank you for the meeting. Yeah, so that's something that we would be looking toward to, uh, to take advantage of with the dog park. And yeah. this Switching gears briefly for my final comment, promise. Uh, in terms of the court lights, uh, several people, including my uh, good friend and neighbor, Brianna, mentioned it helps light the pathways, but in all due respect, that is not their purpose. And Correct. it's a very expensive way to get light on sidewalks. If there's areas of dark where people are walking, I assume it's on a walkway, and I think those lights could be improved. There will be lighting at the Emory Road entrance as soon as the light pylons are installed. There'll be additional lighting. Yeah. 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 But, uh, okay. Sports court lighting to light paths is not a good idea. It's not ideal. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Thank you again. Thanks for your meeting. Thank everybody. You. Thank you. So I know there's a lot of comments that um, there's a lot of really juicy information in here. Um, and we're, we're capturing it all. Um, I will respond to specific questions um, in, the, in the coming days. So um, if it's more than just a comment, I will, um, I will respond to your question. Um, if it's a comment, we will, we're capturing all of that and we're gonna be incorporating that into our feedback. Um, so I think I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We're coming up on eight o'clock. So I want to talk about next steps um, and, and where we're going next. Um, I think we alluded a little bit to it that we have some more work that we need to be doing to confirm the size, you know, the field, the recommendations that we're making for the field. And that will help us narrow down the list of, of, uh, of sites that a dog park could fit in. Um, and then work through, we're continuing to work through um, the court's issue and see if there's, if we just leave it as it is and that's it. Um, or if, if there's some other way we can, we can work out a solution. Um, so we, we are gonna be coming back with those final recommendations late winter 21, probably March is what I'm thinking. Um, and this presentation is on the website should be on the website this evening um, or check tomorrow morning. Uh, so you can send that link to, uh, to friends. Uh, you can scan that QR code if you're super handy or you can go to uh, boston.gov. Um, I usually go to the search and just type in ringer and the article that pops up is the, is the website. Um, and please contact me if you have any additional questions. Kyle and Danielle, before I wrap up entirely, do you guys have any final comments or thoughts? No, other than to thank everyone for all their comments. It's really helpful to get this feedback okay. so we can develop the design further. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so on the project website, you'll also find previous meeting information, the presentation, and you can watch the previous video as well. Uh, we put in presentation slides and later on this week, um, or early next week, you should see this video, a video of tonight coming up. You can contact me at, uh, at kathy.baker-eclipse or my phone by 617-961-3058. Uh, if you Google me, I'm the, first, I'm the only Kathy Baker Eclipse. Um, you can also sign up for Park's emails at bit.ly bit slash get dash parks dash emails. I can't believe we're the only uh, city that has thought of that bitly. Um, or use 311 to contact the parks department um, at Boston Parks DEPT is, uh, is all of our social media handles. It's a great follow. You can get your recommendations and your, uh, your reminders about community meetings. Um, so check out all of those as well. We also have some great fitness stuff that's going on this winter. You can work out at home. I have not signed up for those yet, but I keep meaning to. Um, so um, I want to thank you all for joining this meeting. It was really helpful for us. I hope it was also helpful for you. Um, 
if we didn't get your question tonight, I'm going to respond to respond to those in the coming days. So um, I want to thank you all for all of your feedback, all of your time, and uh, I know that we really do appreciate all of your your efforts. So thank you, and have a good night.